But while we were on this subject uh, of the ongoing growth of the Palestine Solidarity Movement and especially how it's interacting with our institutions, including uh, our higher education institutions where students are really doing a great job all around the country, uh, we want to bring on our next guest, Professor Jody Dean, who is obviously a frequent guest of this show and someone who has uh, always been in solidarity with the Palestinian people and their struggle against occupation and apartheid, uh, recently faced a little backlash herself uh, in the context of this, but Jody we are very honored that you are willing to join us here on the show and take some time out of your schedule. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, it's really great to have you. I, I mean, I don't want to put too much on this, but I mean, I know some people may have seen that you were, uh, you've were you been suspended from teaching duties uh, at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And I, I guess I just wanted to offer you the opportunity if there was something you really wanted to say in terms of the context you feel people should have uh, as they continue to see uh, your case alongside those of, of many others in campuses around the country who are facing backlash for being in favor of the, the Palestinian people's right to self-determination. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, it's really incredible how much, essentially how much, how exciting it is that the movement has grown to such a great extent. I mean, the footage you were showing from Colombia is inspiring. The marches that have been going on for, you know, coming up seven months now in solidarity in the U.S. and around the world. This is what we have to keep our focus on, right? we got to keep our focus on the brave, unbelievably brave students um, who are speaking out across the country. And like Asna um, Tabassum, um, who was, you know, uh, blocked from giving her well-earned um, valedictory speech by USC. I mean, this is ridiculous, but she's brave and people are fighting back. And that's the most important thing. And of course, you know, the institutions that are holding in place um, U.S. imperialism, um, they're holding in place a system in the United States that spends billions, countless billions in support of Israel. Um, they're not going to just take this. It's not that we're like, we call it fight back for a reason. It's not like they just lie down. And so one of the things that's happening as our strength grows is that the institutions get more and more afraid. And so they want to try to make everyone afraid to speak out. And one of the ways that they're doing this on college and university campuses is by targeting students and targeting faculty who express solidarity with Palestine. They're afraid that when more and more people join the call to, you know, to endorse, support and further the self-determination of the Palestinian people, um, that like they don't know what to do. And so they're trying to push back against us. But we know they won't win. Um, but it might be, you know, the battle continues. And so that's one of the things that's going on. I've been relieved from um, teaching for the rest of the semester. There is an investigation. This is all on the basis of one article that I wrote um, on the that was published on the Verso blog, um, but the kind of um, pro-Zionist Twitter mobs got a hold of it and started targeting um, the administration and trustees in my institution, and so um, they are um, they've instituted a process, shall we, shall we say? But you know, it's obviously it's a violation of, of free speech, and that part's just really really clear, but by going after a tenured professor. I mean, I've been there 30 years, I'm a tenured professor. They're really just trying to intimidate other people. So in a lot of ways, it's actually not really about me. It's about them trying to show, oh, if you speak out, we're gonna go after you, but you know, they won't win. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, and I've, I've just even been seeing online, you've been getting a lot of support, you know, from all around the world, because I think people see this context of this. And it, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was reflecting on my own college years uh, earlier today, thinking about this interview, Jody, because, you know, and also what's happening at Columbia, what's been happening at the Claremont colleges, you know, my alma mater, Howard, even, you know, it's like when you're there as a student, they always are telling you, you know, when you come in as a freshman, it's all about inquiry and, you know, debate and different ideas. And you got to go out there and be bold and stand up for what you believe in. But then it feels like, here 
here we have, you know, I think most people would say one of the great moral crises of our time. And it's almost like students especially are being punished almost for uh, taking on the ethos that is sort of the ethos we are told we're supposed to be, you know, engaging in in higher education. So, I mean, I wonder if this moment is also an interesting moment to sort of interrogate uh, what higher education in America under capitalist society really is all about. Oh, that's a great point. Um, it seems like particularly in the last you know, 30 or 40 years, college education has been about don't think, obey, right? Shut your eyes. Don't accept the reality that's going on around you, <laughs> the reality of protest, the reality of genocide. Don't think about that. Just focus on your own little step-by-step -step process until you get a degree and you can make that money. And by cutting off so much of our lives, right, by health healthcare, we can't, no one can afford health care in our country. And so we have to get it from employers if we're lucky enough to get a job. And so you get afraid to lose your job because you lose your health care. Or if you're a student, you need to make sure you get your degree because you've got a whole bunch of student debt. Why? Because our education system is utterly out of whack and completely, completely crazily expensive. So the, the capitalist context really creates this, um, you know, this container, this crucible that lets the institutions attack free speech and try to control people's minds. Mm. You know, it's an interesting point uh, that is connected to another thing. There was a, I don't know if you saw the New York Times had an article over the weekend about Virginia Fox, who's been leading the efforts in Congress to bring the, you know, college presidents there. And, you know, the sort of subtext of it is that, you know, she's from sort of a poor backwoods place and that this is sort of like a almost like a form of like working class revenge against the elites or something like that to be holding them accountable. And, you know, Joseph McCarthy kind of held himself up in the same way, you know, tail gunner Joe, normal guy from Wisconsin. And it also feels like this is a moment that's sort of revealing this faux populism amongst many of these, you know, right wing sectors of society where they're saying, oh, well, look at these elite colleges that, you know, are supporting this, uh, this, that, and the third terrible thing to try to find some way to identify with the, the working class. I'm just sort of now going off on a tangent, but uh, I guess I guess the general the question point I, I, I want your reflections on is, you know, the this very idea, this very moment that somehow, you know, going after that Harvard students exercising their right to free speech, if the university doesn't immediately expel them, that somehow that's a form of privilege that is, you know, somehow against the interests of the working class. Yeah, that's a great um, analysis and a really interesting way into uh, thinking about this, Eugene. Um, it really is a faux populism, right? Because what it's doing is, is using the pretense, I mean, it's using the reality of class conflict in the United States, but using it against actual people, right? It's using it to support the institutions, to support the top of the institution, to support, you know, a kind of constraint on thinking and learning um, rather than support, you know, like it, it's not like they're going out, out there saying, oh, the, edu the education needs to be broadened. It needs to be opened. It needs to bring in more and more people. No, they're doing the opposite. I don't think any working person in this country says, oh, no one should think. Right. I think that actually most everybody wants to be able to learn and think for themselves. They want to be able to have a discussion with other people. And any time that an elite gets in there and starts to say, oh, I know what I'm talking about. I'm with the people. The people want to shut the students up. The people want to shut down thinking. No, no, no. That's just a clear sign that we're dealing with nothing but demagoguery and the new and the new McCarthyism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it seems like it's also an interesting point to sort of reflect on history and maybe the way we teach history. I mean, this is something I, you know, I've talked about a lot on this show. I mean, you know, of course, in the and I'm glad this is the case, you know, in the context of the Native Americans who faced a genocide in this country, the history of slavery. I mean, the abolitionists, of course, who were heavily denounced at the time as being the worst of the worst. Now we teach that, oh, they were so great. And this was like the ethos of our country. And this is what built up our moral foundation. And they were great. And they were very moral. And we should be following the, uh, the the footsteps of the abolitionist in particular when we think about the American context, the Native people trying to protect their way of life uh, in that context. I mean, all of it is important, but it's, it just seems 
like when you have that historical removal, well, it was 400 years ago. Um, and it feels that, you know, the way it, it speaks to me about some of the way we teach history, that we can have this moment where in college campuses, where people are learning all of these different things in the midst of an of a actual genocide that we can see live on TV, that it's considered illegitimate for students to say, well, hey, I read about Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and all these other people and Nat Turner and others. I read about, you know, Tecumseh and the people trying to hold on to their land and, you know, looking at all these things I've been taught, it feels like I should take action. And it just seems like that is also an interesting, uh, you know, element of this as well, of how, in terms of how we teach people to think, that that sort of historical remove is used so, you know, effectively to say this thing was terrible, but you can never really bring it forward and use that hindsight in terms of foresight, in terms of taking your actions. I don't know if that really made sense, what I'm saying there, but just some thoughts I've been having. It made a lot of sense. Um, in one of my classes in the fall, um, in October, we were reading essays um, about Nat Turner. And yeah. those were assigned. We, were, we wrote the syllabus, you know, like a, several months before and never and had no idea it would be so relevant. And so we could talk directly about the Nat Turner Rebellion and the way that the slaves rose up and slaughtered the masters and their families in their beds and their cause was righteous. And it's a painful and difficult thing, but they were fighting against slavery. They were rising up out of their out of their slavery. And we everybody knows this or not everybody, but anybody who who knows history knows this now and holds up that as an important point in the black freedom struggle in the United States. And it is crucial that I mean, we were happy to have it in the course, um, in part because it gave us a language and example for talking about things that were very difficult to um, address directly at that time. And many times historical examples can be, they can be food for thought that people can bring up later on. And they give us a context so that we can always understand when people are struggling for freedom, they, they, they have the right, they have the right and the duty to rise up. I mean, that's what self-determination is. And I mean, we all respect that. And that's what's so, you know, that, it's just a, it's a crucial part of what it is to be a free human being is to be able to determine your conditions and to be able and for a people to be able to determine their conditions. So learning that history is crucial and being able to recognize that history in the present because we're seeing that right now. Right, we're seeing people who are resisting occupation, they're resisting siege, they're resisting the being cleared off from their land for over seventy five years, and you know. It, and it and it's and it's exciting, and for some people, it's shocking to kind of have the the blinders off their eyes at this point. Yeah, no, I, I one of my sort of favorite memes has become people who say you always see people always say, "What would you have done during slavery?" Well, whatever you're doing now, like that is what you would have done. And I think it's it's a good point because you know even then, many people didn't speak out; they were afraid to speak out. There was a lot of consequences. You could you know go to jail, be killed, all these different things that were happening. People losing their livelihoods. So you know, very very contemporary. And I appreciate what you're saying about the role of of history and, and even just the context of of what we're seeing. I mean, you mentioned earlier. You know, we're seven months in, and I think I, – I don't even know. I'd have to think about it, I guess. But I, I feel I've probably seen, like, the top ten worst things I've ever seen in my life – in the post-October 7th period. I mean, things that I just never would have imagined um, to ever see. I mean, it really has just been so shocking. And it feels like that is also an important element of, and, and you already sort of spoke to this, but maybe just to sort of advance the, you know, continue to hammer the point home. I mean, the, the importance of speaking out in this moment, the importance of saying something and not allowing people to just control the narrative from the mainstream media and others, even if, you know, things, it, and I guess maybe this is where I'm really going. Things can be difficult in terms of a conversation. They can be hard to have in terms of a conversation. But if we actually want to get to the root cause of what's going on as it concerns Palestine, we have to have those difficult conversations. And it just seems that it's an important time for, for writing, for language, for communication, for media, specifically because of that, because I feel people are feeling so much so deeply. And, you know, those of us who have the opportunity to articulate that are playing such an important role in helping give people the tools they need to keep having those conversations with those around them to actually solve the problem rather than keep talking about it for another 75 years. People will not be able to talk about Palestine if they don't talk about Palestine, right? And so, and, and that means they have to keep doing it. And the thing is, is that 
um, it just takes a few baby steps and it just takes one or two people. And then it starts to get bigger and bigger and more and more, as we see with more and more people coming out there at, at this particular action going on at Columbia, but also as we've seen during the movement um, overall. You know, one of the, the crazy things in um, some you know higher ed environments is the way that college administrations act that you can't talk about Palestine without that being harmful to Jewish students. Now, that's a real disrespect to Jewish students. It's really a real disrespect given um, how many Jewish students um, have had their organization shut down because of their activism, how much they've been campus leaders, how brave they are, and how much they are uh, really changing the norms, changing the expectations in their own communities. And so I just, this the whole mindset of safety and protection, and the only thing we can do is like express our feelings and make sure we respect everyone as if what's going on is not a genocide. Like that's part, breaking through that is really an important part of this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I share the sentiments that you've said that it's so, uh, you know, to see so many people coming out on Palestine, so many people starting to talk about Palestine, people I know who weren't political on any issue who are now doing things because of this genocide and what they're seeing. And I think part of the reason why, you know, especially I've been, you know, working in Palestine Solidarity since 2002 is it, it's, it hasn't been that kind of outpouring. And it's just like, yes, finally, the scale's falling off people's eyes. But, you know, in that context, I was just curious to ask you, you know, how did you first hear and learn about Palestine? I mean, how did this become an issue um, that you really took on as a, as a core issue? Oh, my God, I didn't expect that question. Um, <laughs> I, I, well, there are a couple of answers. One answer is, you know, I've been a communist for a long time, and that's just kind of what we do, yeah. right? Like, like we're always on the side of Palestine. Like, I've just, that's sort of in, my, in the air that I breathe. But I've been to Ramallah. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to Ramallah to be part of um, a, a kind of lecture reading discussion thing called Reading Marks in Ramallah. Mm. And it was an incredible experience. Um, I mean, I, I, I just I could not understand this barrier wall and the checkpoints. And um, like I went to Hebron and to see a neighborhood carved up where it was just like, oh, you know, I, some settlers came in and they wanted this house. And so they took it and then the IOF defends them. And, and this was shocking. And then being in, you know, um, East Jerusalem and people saying, oh, you know, these nets are there because the, um, you know, Israelis will throw things on us or here's a house where they're taking this, this is my grandfather's. And so being in Ramallah, it was, it, it, it was, it was just, it was like something I have never experienced in my life. Um, and I, um, I've never written about it because I didn't want to be one of those people who's like, oh, I'm making it about me and my knowing uh, my going to Ramallah. And so I thought that the best way was to make sure that no matter what, I would always be doing everything I can um, in solidarity with Palestine. I mean, it had been, so it had been a kind of political, um, just like the political air, like what you do. And then it became, um, like, oh no, no, this is, this is a, uh, this is a conviction. This is, this goes way deep. This is what you, there's no choice. You, you have to be against this occupation. You have to be on the side of the Palestinian revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's a poignant point. There's a, I think it's Dwight Bullard was his name. He was a state senator in, in Florida, and he, they were coming after him a few years ago. And he said, listen, if you go there as a black person, it's like you never imagine what you've seen. And he's like, I can't not speak out. And I think that's an important piece and a, and a very, very powerful piece. Well, Jody, I just have to say I really appreciate you taking some time. I know it's a lot going on, and you know we are always happy to have you as a friend of the show and a friend of the network here at Breakthrough News. I'd say your book, Comrade, is more needed than ever right now as we continue to get organized and move on. And it was really an honor to have you here uh, and give some of your time on the Freedom Side this week. Thanks so much, Eugene.